Remember when space travel, actually leaving Earth, felt like pure science fiction, straight out of books or movies? Well, buckle up, because today we're diving deep into how that fantasy is uh, becoming a very real thing for more and more people. We're going to explore the incredible world of spaceflight. We'll look at how it went from being this, you know, government-only club to this new frontier pushed by private companies. And it's not just about a few fancy rockets. It's like a fundamental shift in our reach for the stars. Our mission here is to unpack the really big changes, maybe some surprising facts, and figure out what this all actually means for you, for all of us, and our future off this planet. You might think space is distant, but its effects. Much closer than you imagine. Exactly. And what's really fascinating is that it's more than just uh, a new form of transport. It's fundamentally changing our whole relationship with space. Who gets to go? Who has a say? It's moving from just nations competing to something more, well, global and commercial. Okay, so let's unpack that transition. Yeah. For decades, right, space was NASA, it was Roscosmos and Russia, these huge government agencies. They had the money, the tech, the astronauts, the whole show. Right. But now... That picture looks completely different. We're seeing these private pioneers, companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic. They're not just building rockets. They're pushing the tech forward incredibly mm -hmm. fast. And they're literally opening up space, the final frontier, to, well, potentially anyone who can afford it. It's a major realignment. And it's happened so quickly. I mean, it feels like just yesterday that only government astronauts flew. Now we have civilians going up. It's sort of... Uh, democratizes space in a way mm -hmm. from this elite national thing driven by you know the cold war mm -hmm. into a commercial business the speed that's the really surprising part i think yeah that speed is incredible and none of this would be happening without a huge leap in the actual rocket technology that's the engine driving this new era isn't it for so long rockets were basically throwaway items insanely expensive to build launch once and then splash down or burn up but this idea of reusable spacecraft, people thought it was maybe impossible or at least impractical. Now it's absolutely central to making spaceflight more affordable. It tackles that huge economic barrier head on. And we have real examples now. It's not just theory. Look at SpaceX's Falcon 9. It launches, does its job, and then comes back down for this pinpoint landing, upright. That controlled landing using grids, fins, and engine burns, it used to be science fiction. Now it's almost routine. It's like ballet with rockets. Blue Origin's New Shepard does something similar for its suborbital flights. And Virgin Galactic's VSS Unity is designed for reuse too. Air launched and then gliding back. And the impact, it's huge. Think about it. A Falcon 9 launch used to be, what, $60 million or so? With reusability, the rocket itself, the most expensive part, flies again. That cuts the cost per launch dramatically. Maybe 70%, even more. It's not just a discount. It's completely changing the economics. What was a billion-dollar government project for astronauts? is becoming, okay, still a very expensive luxury, but a luxury for adventurous civilians. That's such a critical point. <laughs> because reusability isn't just about lowering the price of one launch. It changes the whole economic model. It shifts space from being purely a government cost, you know, for science or national pride, into something that can actually be a commercial business. Now, sure, there's maintenance, refurbishment, checking everything. That adds complexity. But the basic math works. Fly more missions for less money per mission, and suddenly you can do a lot more build things in space, support tourism. Ultimately, it's about scale, sustained access, things we couldn't really dream of just 10, 15 years ago. Okay, let's get <laughs> personal for a second. Imagine, what is it actually like to leave Earth? For so long, it was just something to read about, right? A dream. But these recent tourist flights, we're hearing directly from the people who've done it. And their reactions are, well, pretty amazing. Picture it, you're strapped in, the roar, the push, then suddenly you're climbing fast, the blue sky turns black, then silence. You're floating, weightless, and below you, there it is, Earth, that bright blue curve against the blackness. Just hang in there. People say even those few minutes on a suborbital trip change you forever. It's not just a ride, it's perspective shifting. And there are different options starting to emerge now. You've got the suborbital hops from Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, a quick, thrilling taste of space just over the edge. Then there are orbital missions. SpaceX did Inspiration4, sent yeah. civilians around the Earth for days in a crew dragon. That's a whole different level. And people are already planning further out. Lunar flybys, longer stays on space stations. Companies like Axiom Space are building modules for commercial habitats. It's happening. Right, the big question, the cost. Mm. Let's be real, it's currently hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars per ticket. So yes, definitely a luxury item right now. But here's the interesting part. The trend is downwards. Think about 
Apollo billions and billions in today's money. Now, a private orbital seat is in the low millions, still a lot, but the rate of decrease is pretty staggering compared to old government cost projections. And with more companies competing, more tech advances. The hope is that cost keeps falling, making it accessible to, well, more people eventually. That brings up a really interesting point, though. What's the unique value of this personal experience compared to, say, a purely scientific robot mission? Science is vital, of course. But there's something powerful about people going themselves. Maybe, maybe it's reigniting that public excitement for space, like we saw back in the Apollo days. And that excitement, that inspiration has knock-on effects, doesn't it? Gets kids interested in science and engineering, builds wider support for spending money on space exploration. Generally, it makes space feel real, achievable, not just for astronauts, but for humanity. It's like creating the initial demand, the seed market. Absolutely. Absolutely. But like any new frontier, it's not all smooth sailing, is it? There are real challenges here. We need to talk about those two. One huge issue is space debris, junk. Decades of launches have left orbit cluttered with dead satellites, old rocket parts, fragments from collisions. Experts track tens of thousands of pieces bigger than a softball, but there are millions of smaller bits. And they're all whipping around at incredible speeds. Even a tiny fleck of paint can cause serious damage at those velocities. Remember the shuttle window chip. So agencies and new companies are working hard on tracking this stuff better and even developing ways to clean it up. It's a massive job and kind of a new industry in itself. And then there are the environmental questions. Rocket launches release emissions. As they get more frequent, there's growing pressure to find greener fuels, more sustainable ways to get off the planet. And it's true. These are significant challenges. They need serious thought and action. But they're also driving innovation, aren't they? Trying to solve the debris problem, trying to reduce launch emissions that could lead to breakthroughs in materials, robotics, autonomous systems, things that help us here on Earth, too. It's interesting how whole new businesses are popping up just to tackle these space-specific problems. They're finding value in solving the challenges. That's a great way to look at it. Challenges sparking innovation. But is there a risk, maybe, that the problems like debris or emissions could grow faster than our ability to fix them, especially with plans for huge satellite constellations? That's definitely a concern. It's why it's not just an engineering puzzle. It's also about policy, international agreements. Innovation is happening fast, yes, but the scale of potential future activity means we probably need rules and cooperation now, not after it becomes a crisis. It's a bit of a race, really, and the stakes for keeping space usable are pretty high. That makes sense. It needs that forward thinking. Huh. And, okay, while the challenges are real, the potential opportunities from commercial space... They could be enormous, right? Possibly outweighing the risks if we manage them well. This whole sector is already boosting innovation way beyond just aerospace. It gets young people excited about STEM subjects. And long term, who knows? Maybe medical discoveries from microgravity research, maybe amazing new materials, maybe even energy solutions we haven't even thought of yet. I like the analogy with aviation. Think how air travel changed everything. Global business, communication, connecting people. Space travel might just unlock the next level of science and industry. Absolutely. Looking at the bigger picture, commercial space isn't just tourism. It's really a launch pad. It's about building the infrastructure, the know-how, the capability to do much bigger things later on. It could open up whole new economic areas, new avenues for discovery, maybe like the early internet did. Creating value we couldn't predict. And maybe the most exciting part is how space tourism fits into that bigger story of space exploration. It's not just a sideline. It feels like a catalyst. By making space feel real and attainable, it's definitely sparking that public interest again, inspiring a new generation of scientists, engineers, dreamers, really. And crucially, having private companies involved is speeding things up. Ideas that used to be pure speculation, permanent space stations, bases on the moon, even settling Mars. These aren't just government pipe dreams anymore. They're starting to look like actual business plans driven by competition and private investment. That vision, you know, of humans becoming a multi-planetary species, mm -hmm. it, it still feels far off, but maybe less so now. And the commercial investment is key, isn't it? How does it accelerate that dream? Well, it spreads the risk. It brings in diverse funding. Instead of just one or two government agencies footing the bill and taking all the risk, you have multiple companies pushing forward, innovating. That naturally speeds things up. Mm. It shares the load for these massive undertakings. So, you know, commercial space could actually end up fostering more international cooperation, creating new economic growth, driving breakthroughs, all benefiting us back here. So wrapping this up, what does it all mean for you listening right now? 
It means space tourism is shaping up to be one of the most transformative industries this century. It's changing what we think is possible, not just for travel, but for humanity's whole future out there. As the costs keep coming down, as the tech keeps getting better, the stars are genuinely becoming a destination, not just a distant light. Yeah, the space age isn't just history anymore. It's our future. And uh, that future is happening right now. So stay curious, keep following the developments, and keep dreaming, because space really is opening up. And it's waiting.